Here are a few conditional proof exercises that we can walk through, and after we've done, gone through them, we'll take a look at another proof strategy called indirect proof. So here we have a conclusion that's a conditional statement. H implies, and notice what its consequent is, it's another conditional statement. C implies W. So the assumption here is going to be the assumption, the antecedent of the conclusion, which is H, and we're going to work until we get to the consequent of the conclusion, which is if C then W. But if C then W is also a conditional statement, so we may very well want to assume that uh, antecedent as well. So the first step is to write the conditional, uh, the antecedent of the conditional statement we're after as the an assumption for a conditional proof, ACP. And with that, you immediately see uh, that unlocks something from premise 2. You get S. You notice that uh, S and H are the antecedent for line 1, so you can build that antecedent by this conjunction of 3 and 4, and that brings out the consequent of line 1, H implies C implies W. Now, it might appear that we're done, because that's the conclusion. H implies C implies W. H implies C implies W. But we're not done, because when you make an assumption, you then have to, at a certain point, come back to the uh, original margin and write that assumption, H, implies what you have found. And we certainly don't want to write at line 7, H implies, H implies, C implies, W. We want to write H implies, C implies, W. So we need to go on yet again uh, and make another modus ponens move. Number 3 with number 6 brings C implies, W by itself. And now we can say the conditional proof is over and return to the original margin with line 8 and say H, assumed at line 3, has led to C implies W, CP 3 through 7. Here's another one. The antecedent in this case is a compound statement, so that's a good lesson. Don't, be, don't always assume that the antecedent that you're going to assume is going to be a simple statement. Here it's going to be a compound statement because you always assume the antecedent, whatever is in front of the horseshoe. So C wedge B is the assumption. Now notice that C wedge B is a disjunction of the antecedent of line 1 with the antecedent of line 2. That's going to yield the disjunction of the consequent of line 1 with the consequent of line 2, a CD. And the intermediate step to get to the CD is to conjoin those two statements from 1 and 2, and then, uh, because CD in our set of rules is a two-line rule, it's a conjunction of conditionals plus the disjunction of their antecedents, and it yields the disjunction of their consequence. Now, we're trying to get A. That's the goal in order. We've assumed C wedge B. We're going after A. A is going to have to come out of here somehow. Here's a move we haven't really seen in these uh, PowerPoints yet. Distribution. Distribution, take a look at your set of rules of replacement, is going to rewrite this disjunction of conjunctions into a conjunction that has uh, a disjunction as one of its parts. Now A is uh, to the left of the main operator, so it can be simplified. So now we've got C wedge B as an assumption. It has led to A, so we're done, and we can say C wedge B implies A, conditional proof, 3 through 7. And here's again, um, here's one we actually will do to conditional proofs. The conclusion is a conditional statement. The consequent is a conditional statement. So we're going to do a, we're going to assume C, and then we're going to assume E. And from the E assumption, so we're going to have two two CPs. Here's the assumption. Now we're aiming for E wedge E horseshoe F as the as the consequent. When we get done here, we're going to write E horseshoe F before we connect back out to the margin. E horseshoe F is a conditional statement, so we could assume its antecedent E. Now what we would want to do is work from E until we get to F. And then we would say E implies F. And then we would say C implies E implies F. So E gives us a modus ponens um, from 2 and 4. That gets D implies F. And uh, we can do the modus ponens that C already made available from line 3 with line 1 and get D wedge tilde E. We're going to rewrite line 5 
which is now a wedge as a horseshoe by the rule called implication. And then we're going to switch the order and negate both parts of that by transposition to E implies D. That sets up a hypothetical syllogism, E implies D, D implies F, so E implies F. Now E implies F, this is like one we saw a minute ago, that's not the end of the proof because we don't want to say C implies E implies F. What we've done is we've made an assumption here of E, so we can't write E implies F at line 10 as the consequent that we're trying to get to unless we write it as, a, as the ending of this conditional proof that was opened at line 4. There's an assumption made at line 4. If E, we can't we have to quit that assumption by saying if E then F. And this is not the E what if the E implies F that started out from there. But if we take line 9 and we take line 4, we do modus ponens, we get F from it. Now at line 11, we can say, so this assumption of E led to F through a conditional proof. And that consequent, E implies F, that came about as a result of this assumption, C, at line 3. So 3 through 11 led to C implies E implies F. So this nesting of one conditional proof inside another conditional proof, something you should uh, work on, and I would repeat this exercise right here, and look for examples like this in the exercise set. And it always is going to work the same way. You assume the antecedent of what you want to prove, and then you work until you get to its consequent. If the consequent is a conditional, you assume its antecedent, and you work until you get to its consequent. But for every ACP that you write, there has to be a line further on where you write CP and you close off the work that was begun by that assumption. Now here's another strategy called indirect proof, which has the old name reductio ad absurdum. And what that means is that you assume the conclusion is false. That's going to be the assumption. You have a you have a set of premises and a conclusion, you assume the conclusion is false, and then you show that that assumption leads to a necessarily false statement, a self-contradiction. Anything that leads to a self-contradiction has to be false. So that means the assumption was false, and the assumption was that the conclusion was false, which means the conclusion is true. Concretely, the conclusion is tilde s, so assume that that's false. You're going to write, it is false, that tilde s. Assumption for indirect proof, AIP. Now you can go uh, do a modus tollens with that. That sets up with line 1, a modus tollens. You get neither S nor T from that. If you do De Morgan's to that, you get not S and not T. And if you simplify that, you get not S. Now you'll notice that tilde tilde S is the same thing as S. So this has led to us being able to say S is true and so is not S. That's a self-contradiction. Self-contradiction can't be true, so we can say that's false, therefore what led to it is false. What led to it was this assumption, therefore this assumption is false, which means tilde s is true. So the move is assume that conclusion is false, and then work until you get a self-contradiction, and then say the conclusion is true. This is going to be the case no matter what the conclusion is. If it's a compound statement, if it's a um, simple statement, if it's a negated statement, you're going to take the whole conclusion and put a tilde in front of it in order to create the negation that you need for an assumption of an indirect proof. As you'll see in this one, here we have a wedge statement as the conclusion, so you put that whole thing in parentheses and put a tilde in front of it as your assumption because you want to negate the whole conclusion. Don't put the tilde right in front of the e tilde s, you put the tilde in front of the, of the whole expression, which is a disjunction. Now, as soon as we've done that, we can, we've set up a De Morgan's rule move, so we get s dot u from it. Simplify to s, simplify to u, and note that line 5 is the antecedent of line 3, so we can get tilde r by modus ponens at line 8. Line 2, u implies not to your r. Line 7 says u is true, therefore not to your r is true. And that is a disjunctive, sets up a disjunctive syllogism with 8 and 9, 
e either not T or R, not R, therefore not T. Notice that a commutation takes place there. Go back to line 1, and here's S at line 6, sub T or not U. Again, a disjunctive syllogism, 9, 11, and uh, 10 gets tilde U. What are we looking for? We're looking for a self-contradiction. We got tilde U at line 12, and here but we had had U at line 7. We could have found some other contradiction. We might have gotten tilde S. We might have gotten R dot tilde R. We might have gotten T dot tilde T. It doesn't matter as long as we find something that's a self-contradiction. U dot tilde U is the one we've got. And so as soon as we write that as a conjunction, we then say the conclusion is true. Indirect proof sequence 4 through 13.